20 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds, guidance. The Bible and Shakespeare don't count, apparently. Six successful missions were completed by the Apollo program between 1969 and 1972, bringing humanity to the moon for one of the most historic moments in American and arguably global history. That is the story, anyway. Before his death, Cambridge University physicist and best-selling author Stephen W. Hawking revealed something terrifying about the moon landing. Hawking became an icon of human perseverance and curiosity as he explored the cosmos from a wheelchair while pondering the nature of gravity and the origin of the universe. Is it possible that the moon landing was faked by NASA and the U.S. government? Is there any way to establish that humans visited the moon beyond a shadow of a doubt? Is it possible that the moon landing was the biggest deception ever perpetrated? Come along as we discuss this hot button issue and examine the horrifying moon landing secret that Stephen Hawking uncovered. Since Albert Einstein, no scientist has captivated the public's attention and won the hearts and minds of tens of millions of people worldwide. In 1988, Stephen Hawking released a Brief History of Time, From the Big Bang to Black Holes, which was a major contribution to that. More than 10 million copies have been sold, and Errol Morris was motivated to make a documentary on it. The critically acclaimed 2014 feature film, The Theory of Everything, which starred Academy Award winner Eddie Redmayne as Dr. Hawking, was based on his tale. As one of the greatest physicists to live, Stephen Hawking, refused to let a rare motor neuron condition that confined him to a wheelchair limit him. Even though he was warned at the age of 22 that he would not have much time left to live, he continued to live for decades after that, using his imagination to journey across space and make significant advances in the fields of relativity and black hole science, which fascinated people all over the world. He didn't stop there, either. Later on, he rose to prominence as a leading authority on gravity and the characteristics of black holes, bottomless gravitational abysses so dense and deep that not even light can escape them. That effort, which culminated in the final months of 1973, when Hawking attempted to apply quantum theory, the strange principles that govern subatomic reality, to black holes in his brain, marked a watershed moment in contemporary physics. Black holes, the mythical avatars of cosmic doom, were not truly black at all, as Hawking revealed in a long and arduous calculation. In reality, he discovered, they would slowly lose power over the millennia, spewing radiation and particles until exploding and disappearing. Hawking radiation, as it is now commonly called, completely flipped the script on our understanding of black holes. The fantasy of a final theory was yanked in an unexpected new direction, and they went from being destroyers to creators, or at least recyclers. He considered only cosmology interesting, since it addressed the big question, where did the universe come from? On April 12, 2016 in New York, Stephen Hawking was seated on stage for the Starshot Initiative's unveiling with financier Yuri Milner. He urged people to leave Earth once more he stated that in order to bring humanity together around the common goal of expanding beyond Earth, people ought to make a swift return to the moon. According to Hawking, leaving Earth is imperative given the challenges posed by climate change and the depletion of natural resources. He declared, We are running out of space and the only places to go to are other worlds. It is time to explore other solar systems. Spreading out may be the only thing that saves us from ourselves, I am convinced that humans need to leave Earth. If humanity is to continue for another million years, our future lies in boldly going where no one else has gone before. The first steps into space, according to Hawking, would elevate humanity because they would require the participation of so many nations. Leaving Earth requires a concerted global approach. Everyone should participate if we are to rekindle the excitement of the early days of space travel in the 1960s. Every great new leap, like the moon landing, unites people and nations and ushers in new discoveries and technologies. 
When astronauts Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong descended the lunar module's ladder and set foot on the moon, it was a historic moment for both the United States and the rest of the world. They were the first men to set foot on the lunar surface. All in all, there was a great deal of excitement around the moon landing. Although the events were covered by the local press, it was still exciting for the public to witness firsthand, and it was also useful for NASA scientists to be able to view the landing in addition to using radio transmission. In order to accomplish this, the Apollo 11 mission carried a camera, allowing the public and NASA to witness the crew's preparations for the moon landing as well as the landing itself. A total of three transmissions were made between the ship and Earth to share the adventure. The most well-known transmission, the actual moon landing, was shown to the world on July 21, 1969, and featured Armstrong and Aldrin descending from the lunar module onto the lunar surface. The camera was held free because it was stored on the module. After the two men reached the moon's surface, it was moved from the lunar module and set up on a tripod approximately 30 feet away. This video was beamed back to Earth and picked up by three different locations, Australia's Parks Observatory and Honeysuckle Creek Tracking Station, as well as California's Goldstone Tracking Station. From there, the signals were converted so that they could be broadcast to televisions around the world. As a result, NASA and the world saw the lunar landing almost in real time, with just a few seconds of delay between the filming on the moon and the watching on Earth, due to the distance the signals had to travel. There is a tiny but vocal group of people who refuse to accept NASA's account of the Apollo 11 moon landing and the subsequent media coverage, despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary. One argument is that since the sun is the only source of light, shadows should be entirely dark because it is still possible to see objects in them, which calls for more light. That is almost correct. Although seeing objects in shadows requires additional light, there are other light sources on the moon besides the sun. Consider how similar it is to stare at a sandy beach on a hot day or worse, at snow. The moon's surface creates this backlight by reflecting sunlight. An Apollo astronaut is shown in the top image descending the ladder onto the lunar surface. Naturally, he is dramatically lit, so that television viewers can see him getting ready to take the first human steps on the moon. Ian Goddard set up a series of experiments to test this backlighting effect. Below it, the experiments are displayed. The image on the left employs a more reflective surface, and as you can see, the astronaut is lit. The shadows naturally, stay in their original positions. The image on the right, on the other hand, has black paper covering the surface, preventing light from reflecting off the ground and lighting the astronaut suit. Another criticism of Apollo astronaut photos is that they don't show the stars, which one would think would be more evident in an atmosphere devoid of air. That being said, why do images of Earth obtained from the moon depict a starless, pitch-black sky Compare the number of stars visible on a night with a full moon to one without, and you'll see that the former are much fainter and more difficult to make out than the latter. The Earth, when illuminated by the sun, is millions of times brighter than the stars in the sky, which is why they can't be seen. Our eyes are much more sensitive to light than photographic film, so when we take a picture with a camera that is backlighted, we can clearly see the features and colors of the object while the film will not capture any of this. The film is a light-sensitive emulsion over plastic. When that plastic is exposed to light through the camera's lens, a chemical change produces a negative image of whatever is photographed. Since the Apollo astronauts used film cameras, this explanation is necessary for understanding the answer. A photographer must take into account the lens aperture and shutter speed, which determine how much light reaches the film. A smaller aperture means less light, and a faster shutter speed means more light is blocked. This is similar to how your pupil contracts on a bright day and dilates at night. Any picture that you may see of stars are from time-lapse photos. To take a time-lapse photo of the stars, the shutter must be left open on the camera in order for the lens to focus enough light on the film for the image to show up. Longer times allow more photons to enter the camera and record the image. The image is built over time from the total number of photons striking the film. The dimmer the object, the longer the film must be exposed because there are fewer photons per unit of time reaching the camera than for a brighter object. 
The brightness of an object is directly related to the number of photons that reach a recording device such as your eye or a camera. For example, to get a decent photo of the full moon, the shutter should be open for about a second or two. To record the image of a star, the shutter must be open for several minutes to several hours in order for enough photons to hit the film and make an image. As for the pictures of the astronauts, the sunlight reflecting off of them is so bright that the shutter speed of the camera has to be a fraction of a second. If the exposure was longer, the film would absorb too many photons from the astronauts and they would become washed out and appear as a featureless form of white, the opposite of the underexposed shadow. When deciding on aperture and shutter speed, a photographer must also take into account the subject of the photograph. If the subject is particularly bright, the aperture must be narrowed and the shutter must be opened wider than normal to prevent overexposure. If you were Neil Armstrong taking a picture of Buzz Aldrin on the lunar surface during a bright lunar day, you would want to use a fast shutter speed and a small aperture so that Buzz in his spacesuit would be clearly visible, but other light sources such as the stars would not register on the film. Apollo astronauts left the camera's shutter open longer during some photographic experiments, revealing pinpoints of light behind the bright fuzzy blobs that are the overexposed moon or Earth. This is because the astronauts' cameras were set to capture the most important things in focus, themselves and the moon's surface. As a proof of concept, an image of the Space Shuttle Endeavour docked to the International Space Station during its final mission on May 23, 2011, was taken by an astronaut departing the station on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. This image is unique because it's among the first images of a shuttle docked on the ISS, and because it was also taken at a low exposure rate, which makes the background stars appear invisible. Consider someone trying to take an image of the stars with a disposable camera, their attempts would be less than successful. If you want stars, you need to have a long exposure time. That's precisely why Hubble took so long to capture the ultra-deep field image. On the other hand, a variety of astrophotographers capture images known as nightscapes. These images are able to reveal brilliant color and texture of the sky that you can't get with the unaided eye because the long exposure allows the camera to record more than a fraction of a second's worth of data. Moving on, Another claim is that there must be at least two light sources in the moon photographs because the shadows are produced in opposite directions. First, anyone who has walked around at night under street lamps will have seen multiple shadows cast by different lights. If more than one spotlight was used, we should see multiple shadows for each object. However, this is not the argument made by moon hoaxers. Rather, they are referring to the shadows' orientations. Now, all you will see in the images is one shadow. The reason the shadows appear to be pointing in different directions is due to the fact that photographs are two dimensions and the lunar surface is not perfectly flat. In order to determine whether or not this claim had any basis in reality, a replica of the lunar landing site was constructed and photographed. The resulting image is remarkably accurate, but almost does a better job of disproving the claim as the three cast shadows in the recreation point in different directions from one another, whereas the Apollo image only shows two such directions. Another argument is that dust should have been visible on the lunar module's feet upon landing, suggesting that the module should have stirred up dust throughout its descent. Once more, the module did stir up some dust, but not nearly as much as it would have otherwise. This is because the moon is devoid of air, Air pressure helps propel rockets away from Earth, but on the Moon, nothing moves except dust that comes into contact with exhaust. The American flag that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin planted on the Moon is a well-known example of how misconceptions about NASA technology and lunar physics contribute to a more nuanced argument that the landings were staged. Some images of the flag appear to be waving in the wind. How is that possible given that the Moon has no wind? The flag appears to be fluttering because of a horizontal rod at the top of the pole that keeps it unfurled, giving the impression that the wind is stopping it from hanging down. However, the flag isn't actually fluttering at all, because the moon's weak gravity prevents the flag from uncrumpling, and it has remained motionless for the entire time after the astronauts planted it. One of the strongest arguments that the landings were staged 
is that humans couldn't have safely passed through the Van Allen belts, which are two enormous donut-shaped belts surrounding the Earth and composed of highly energetic charged particles from the solar wind. Some claim that passing through these belts would have required exposure to radiation that would have killed humans. This was a real worry prior to the Apollo missions, which is why the scientists behind Apollo 11 made sure to protect the astronauts as much as possible. They chose a trajectory from Earth to the Moon that minimized the amount of time spent in the Van Allen belts. They also insulated the spacecraft from radiation with an aluminum shell. Though it's less than that experienced by some nuclear energy workers, 0.46 radiation-absorbed dose, RAD, is approximately 10 times more than the radiation exposure of medical professionals who routinely work with X-ray and radiotherapy machines. Readings from the nine Apollo missions that reached the moon showed the astronauts' average radiation exposure of 0.46 radians. This proved NASA was right to shield the astronauts from radiation. A straightforward device put in place by Apollo 1150 years ago is another straw that breaks the theories around the moon hoax. Armstrong and Aldrin set up a lunar laser-ranging retro-reflector array on the moon's surface during their day-long stay. We can reflect lasers off of it and determine the exact distance to the moon down to the centimeter because it is still in use today. This would not have been possible if we hadn't traveled to the moon. There will, of course, always be abnormalities and peculiarities in the data until we go back to the moon, which could lead to fresh accusations that the moon landings were staged. The politics surrounding the moon landing should not be forgotten. Third-party observatories like the Alfred Lovell were able to confirm the authenticity of the moon landing. If the USA had staged the landings, the Russians would have been the first to call them on it. The Russians were listening in on the Apollo astronauts while they were speaking with NASA. Now think about how many individuals were involved in the Apollo program and how many people saw the moon landing on television. In addition to the astronauts, over 400,000 people worked on the Apollo program as scientists, engineers, researchers, and support personnel. Over 600 million people worldwide witnessed the moon landing on television. Why would they all lie about this? Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.